Hey, fourth grade, welcome to day eight of your packet. I'm gonna go over day eight with you. And if you have any questions, please make sure you email me or your teacher to make sure that your questions can be answered and we can give you guys some extra help if we need it. So I'm gonna share my screen with you guys. So welcome to day eight. For your reading and writing task today, for reading, you have to read the story called The Food Change and highlight the lesson in the story as you read the text. Answer questions at the end of the story. So the text, The Food Change, and this is taken right from your packet, I just put it on the smart board. Read closely to determine what the text says explicitly and to make logical inferences from it, cite specific textual evidence, and writing or when writing or speaking to support conclusions drawn from the text. So what that means is that any answer that we come up with, we have to make sure we have text evidence to support it. The food change. My mother took me to see the doctor because lately I had been tired a lot. The doctor checked my temperature and when she checked my heart, and then she checked my heart. Afterwards, she asked, what have you been eating? Usually I find that when someone is tired, they have a nutrition problem. I responded, we have breakfast at school and lunch too. I have milk and cereal for breakfast. Then I eat whatever they have. But what about dinner and weekends? The doctor asked. My mother said, I cook good, healthy food, but she won't eat it. She wants to eat snacks like cookies and candy. Then when it's mealtime, she leaves the food on her plate. No wonder you're tired, the doctor said. You're a growing girl, and you need to maintain a healthy weight. Haven't you heard of the food pyramid? Yes, we studied that, but it's hard to get all those kinds of foods. I told her, it doesn't sound like that is the problem, she said. Your mother is making good food, but you're eating candy and cookies. Do you know how much nutrition there is in those foods? They aren't even on, the food pyra on that pyramid. Sugar gives you a burst of energy, but that does not last long. You need to have a better diet. You need good food su to sustain your energy. You need to eat meat, fruits, and vegetables. When we left the doctor's office, my mother grabbed a booklet. It told what foods to eat. I knew it was going to be a bad time. I reached in my pocket to get a candy and my mother grabbed it right out of my hand. She said that was the end of candy. So I gave her the rest of the candy. This was going to be even worse than I thought. On the way home, my mother bought carrots and raisins at the store. She gave them to me when we got home. I liked the raisins quite a bit, but I did not care for the carrots. That night when we had dinner, I noticed mom had made a salad with raisins and carrots. We had that with chicken and biscuits. I decided this big change wasn't going to be so bad. I still would like some candy, but I know that's not going to happen. So we've read the text now. Now we need to highlight the lesson in the story. So what lesson did she learn in this story? Well, her mom took her to the doctor because she had been tired a lot. And the doctor concluded, the doctor drew a conclusion after asking her what she had been eating, that nutrition was the problem. So then the doctor recommended that she eats better and she eats less candy and less cookies. Then in the last two paragraphs on the way home, my mother bought carrots and raisins at the store. She gave them to me when we got home. I liked the raisins quite a bit, but I did not care for the carrots. That night when we had dinner, I noticed mom had made a salad with raisins and carrots. We had that with chicken and biscuits. I decided this big change wasn't going to be so bad. So that is the lesson that was learned in this story. She learned that, so I'm gonna highlight in paragraph one and two where they talk about nutrition is the problem. And what was the solution for the nutrition problem? To eat better. At the end of the story, the main character, the narrator, decided this change wasn't going to be so bad after all because she ended up kind of liking the raisins. So maybe there's other foods she would end up liking too. So now that we've highlighted the lesson in this story, 
answer the questions at the end of the story. So on the next page, I put the question that is at the end of your reading for day eight. What lesson can people learn from this story? Underline the parts of the story that show that is the lesson you can learn. So we've already highlighted parts in the story so that we already have a pretty good answer to this. I'm going to highlight a little bit more because I think we need a little more text evidence to support they have a nutrition problem. So when people are feeling tired, the doctor says usually they have a nutritional problem. Then the doctor is asking about what kinds of foods the girl eats and she eats cookies and candies. And then she talks about the food pyramid. So talking about nutrition. So we need to now answer the question. What is a lesson people can learn from this story? So I'm gonna go back to what I highlighted. I decided this big change wasn't so bad. So I'm gonna kind of combine all of the things that we highlighted, nutritional problem, can't eat too much cookies and candy, you need to think about the food pyramid, and that some healthy foods are pretty good. She ended up liking raisins quite a bit, and she said, I decided this big change wasn't going to be so bad. So what is the lesson people can learn from this story? People, let's make it a little smaller. People should eat healthy foods to stay healthy. Some healthy foods even taste. Okay, and you might have some different text evidence and you might word your lesson a little bit differently than mine and that's okay too. The next part that we need to work on is the writing for today. Think about a lesson that you have learned in the past. Write a different ending to the fiction story you just read. So the fiction story we just read ended with the character, the narrator, deciding maybe this change wasn't so bad. Think about a lesson that you have learned in the past. Write a different ending to the fiction story you have just read. So I put together a little web here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to think of the a lesson that I've learned about eating healthy. And sometimes when I eat healthy, not only does it make me tired, but it also can make my stomach hurt if I eat too much candy. So maybe my different ending is going to be about that. So maybe I'm going to think about my different ending. My stomach hurt too much from candy, but when I eat better, I feel better. So that's going to be how my ending is a little bit different. And some things I want to include some details about why eating too much candy makes my stomach hurt. Maybe too much sugar. And then you can go ahead and fill these in. I just included this web as a way to organize my thoughts to help me think of a different ending to this fiction story. But you can think of any kind of ending you want. Maybe you want your story to end in a different way and you want to make it a fiction story about how eating candy is the best thing for you. It's totally up to you. Be creative, have some fun. The next problem we're going to work on is a math review from day seven. So yesterday, Ms. Foster introduced you to this problem and she gave us a few hints. I'll reread the problem, then we'll talk about the hints that Ms. Foster gave, then we'll work on solving it. Jacob and his family were moving into a new house and he wanted to pick his bedroom. Which bedroom should he pick? Write a statement to persuade him to pick the room you selected. Then it listed the sizes of all three bedrooms. These were the hints that Ms. Foster gave you guys to solve this problem yesterday. She said, maybe consider that maybe not everyone wants the same size room. And how would you use the dimensions of the room to help you decide? So I'm gonna work on solving this problem using my problem solving steps, and I'm going to fill it out as we go. So to start off with what we know, we know the sizes of the bedrooms. 
Now, when we're talking about sizes, we're talking about area. So we are talking about length times, oops, length times width. And that's how we'll find the area of the bedrooms. And that's what we mean by the size. How big are the bedrooms? So we know that bedroom one is 12 by 13. We know that bedroom two is 13 by 11. And we know that bedroom three is 14 by nine. So what is it asking? It's asking us to find, oops, to find and compare the sizes of the bedrooms, then pick the one that is just right for me. So to solve this problem, you can draw a picture and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw a picture of bedroom one and then solve it. And I'm going to use the area model to help me find the area of bedroom one. So let's draw a rectangle. So this is, oops, this is bedroom one. And let me label my length and my width for bedroom one. So it's 12 by 13. So it is 12 by 13. And now I can break up these numbers because I know how to use the area model to solve multiplication. So I can break up 12 into 10 and two. And I can break up 13 into 10 and three. And I can use that to help me find the area of bedroom one. So to do that, I'm going to make my boxes. And then I'll solve each partial product. So this first one will be 10 times 10. This box will be 10 times 2. This box will be 10 times 3. And this will be 2 times 3. So I'm going to use the little trick that I know of circling the basic facts and bringing down the zeros. So I know that 1 times 1 is 1, and then I bring down two zeros. I know that 1 times 2 is 2, and I bring down one zero. I know that 1 times 3 is 3, and I bring down one zero. And I know this basic fact, 2 times 3 is 6. Now I add them all up. So I add 100 plus, and we can start with, with any two we want. So we'll just do this first two. 100 plus 20, I already know is 120. So I've got that one. And I just like to check the boxes off to make sure I don't add the same thing twice, or I don't forget one. 120 plus 30. Oops. It's hard to draw five. Get my pen. Five, one, got that one, plus six. So the area of bedroom one is 156. So this is, let's label it. Bed room one. Okay, so let's work on bedroom two. Bedroom two is 13 by 11. So we'll make our bedroom. We'll label our sides 13 by 11. Then we can break these numbers up. So we would break 13 up into 10 and 3. And we'll break up 11 into 10 and 1. And we'll go through the exact same steps. Make our partial product boxes. 
and I know that 10 times 10 is 100. I know that 10 times 3 is 30. I know 10 times 1 is 10. And I know 3 times 1 is 3. Now I can add those up. So 100 plus 30 makes 130. So we got that, we got that. Now we need to add 10 again. 140, got that one. Now we need three. So three, four, one. So bedroom two, I'm gonna shorten it. I'll say bed two, the area equals 143. So, so far, which one's larger, bedroom one or bedroom two? Bedroom one is larger. And now let's try bedroom three. Bedroom three, the dimensions are 14 by nine. So we'll build our rectangle. We'll label the sides. So one side is 14, one side is nine. So the only number I'm gonna break up this time is 14. I'm gonna break it up into its tens and ones. And I'm gonna keep nine as it is. Now I'm gonna make my partial product boxes. This time I only need two boxes. So this box would be 10 times nine, which I already know is 90, because I know that basic fact, one times nine, add a zero. Now nine times four, maybe I need to make a T-chart for that. So I'll make my nines T-chart and I'll go to four. One times nine is nine. Two times nine is 18. Three times nine is 27. Hmm. I'm a little stuck here so I can draw my dots. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so I'm at 27. Now I can add on nine. 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36. Oh, okay, good. So now I've got my answer. Nine times four is 36. Now to find the area, I add these up. So 90 plus 36. Nine, 10, 11, 12. So the area of bedroom three is 126. So let's go back to our steps. So we drew the picture on the other page, check. Solving, we said that bedroom, so we'll call it B1, was, let's see, bedroom one was 156. One, five, Six, 156, let's find B2, bedroom two. Okay, bedroom two was 143. And B3, B3, oops, was 126. So we found the area of all the bedrooms. So now we know how big each room is. But now we need to check our work. So to check our work, we could work backwards by dividing. So for example, if I look at, we'll look at bedroom number one again. So if we look back at bedroom number one, we multiplied 12 times 13 to make 156. So let's look back at our work from number one. So we multiplied 12 times 13 and we got 156. To work backwards, we could divide. So we would divide 156 
And we could take, oops, that's kind of messy. We could divide 156 using big seven. So let's take the side 12, because we know 12s. So we're dividing 156 by 12, and we're hoping that we get the other side length as the answer, because we know that multiplication and division are inverse operations. They're the opposite. So if we made a 12t chart, that would help us here. 1 times 12, 2 times 12. 3 times 12, 4 times 12, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Make our line a little longer. So 1 times 12 is 12. 2 times 12 is 24. 36. Oops, that's kind of messy. Get our little eraser, little. Thirty six, forty eight, sixty, seventy two, eighty four. 96, let's see, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 109, 110, 111, 112, 113, 114, 115, 116, 117, 118, 119, 120. hundred twenty one, one hundred twenty two, one hundred twenty three, one hundred twenty four, one hundred twenty five, one hundred twenty six, one hundred twenty seven, one hundred twenty eight, one hundred twenty nine, one hundred thirty, one hundred thirty one, one hundred thirty two. One hundred thirty three, one hundred thirty four, one hundred thirty five, one hundred thirty six, one hundred thirty seven, one hundred thirty eight, one hundred thirty nine, one hundred forty, one hundred forty one, one hundred forty two, one hundred forty three, one hundred forty four. So let's see what we should do first. I think it would be a good idea to do twelve times twelve first since we have one hundred fifty six to give. So we'll subtract one hundred forty four because we are doing twelve times 12, so six take away four is two, five take away four is one, one take away one is zero. So we've got 12 left, so we'll do 12 times one. To get our answer, we add these up and it equals 13. Oh, good, because that's what we were hoping, because we already thought 12 times 13 made 156. Okay, good. So now you can check each problem like that. And that is how we check our work for this problem. But now here comes the last piece of this equation, which is where we talk about why. Because part of this problem asks us to write a statement to persuade him to pick the room you selected. So for example, I might write, well, I think that he should choose the biggest room. So the biggest room was number one. So I might say something like, I think bigger. I think you should pick bedroom number one because it is the Biggest. But now remember, I want to persuade him, so I want to be convincing. So I would put something to make him think, oh, okay, biggest room is the best. Big rooms are best because you can hang lots of things on the walls. You can pack in tons of toys and you have so much 
space. And that, remember, is just my opinion because this question asked you to convince him of your choice. So there's no right or wrong choice to this answer. And remember what Ms. Foster said yesterday that maybe not everyone wants the same size room. So this is just what I think would be the best and why I think he should pick bedroom number one. But you can definitely have a different bedroom and you can definitely have different reasons. Your math problem for today that Mr. Grant will go over with you is this problem. The school cafeteria has nine round tables and three rectangular tables. Each round table has five chairs and each rectangular table has seven chairs. How many chairs are there in all? Now this problem, as soon as I read it, I thought, ooh, this would be a great problem to draw a picture for. I would definitely draw the nine round tables and at each round table I would put five chairs. I would definitely draw the three rectangular tables and at each rectangular table, I would make sure that I draw seven chairs. And that's just one strategy to solve this problem. You could have other strategies to solve it. Don't forget to choose one math game to play today with at least one partner and write down the name of the partner you played with. And please make sure you visit Dreambox and play for at least 20 minutes, then list the names of the games that you played. Today for science, we were reviewing a text that you worked on yesterday with Ms. Foster called Weather Tools. We are specifically looking back at the tools of thermometer, barometer, anemometer, and rain gauge. And then we're completing questions seven through 16 of the weather instruments workshop that you started with Ms. Foster yesterday. So here I have snipped some of the definitions, the paragraphs, of those weather instruments, those weather tools from the article you read with Ms. Foster yesterday. So we're going to review them before we start answering questions. Thermometer. This device measures the temperature of the air and tells us how hot or cold it is. Most thermometers are long and skinny with a bulb and a thin tube filled with either red alcohol or silver mercury. Both alcohol and mercury expand when they are heated and shrink when they are cooled. When the temperature rises, the expanding liquid has no place to go but up the glass tube. The liquid shrinks and lowers back down when the temperature cools. Round thermometers work slightly differently and are not quite as accurate, but many homeowners like the way that they look. Barometer. Imagine a bathroom scale that can weigh the air around us. That's a bit like what a barometer, a barometer does. It measures air pressure the weight of the atmosphere. Inside the case, there is an airtight metal box. If the air pressure around it drops, gets lower, the box expands a little. As the box expands or contracts, a spring moves a pointer on the dial down or up. The dial has numbers and sometimes little illustrations of clouds or sun. The higher the air pressure, the drier the weather is likely to be. Weather reporters say the barometer is rising when the weather will be nice. When the barometer is falling, nasty weather awaits. Rain gauge. To gauge means to measure. A rain gauge measures the rain that has fallen since the last measurement. Rain falls into a large cylinder, then drains through a funnel into a graduated cylinder that has measurement markings on the side. Measurements are made in inches or millimeters. Snow gauges measure snowfall. As you know, rain, snow, and hail are all water. When there is too much rainfall, we get flooding. When there is too little, we call it a drought. In between, in between, we like best. Why do we measure precipitation? Farmers like to know if they need to give more water to their crops. People who control our drinking water supplies might ask us to use less if there has been a drought. It's always a good idea to conserve water. Anemometer. How windy is it? This device measures the wind speed and direction. The most common kind of anemometer measures wind speed using three or four cups attached to a pole. As the cups catch the wind, they spin. Wind speed is measured in miles or kilometers per hour, just like your car's travel speed. The arrow with the big tail points to the wind, points into the wind so that you can record the direction of the wind. A west wind 
means that it is blowing from the west toward the east. Airline pilots and boaters are especially aware of wind speed reports from areas in which they might travel. No one wants to be caught at sea in a dangerous wind. So you are using that information from the article yesterday, as well as this website to help you answer these questions. Match the picture of the weather instrument with its name. So here's the picture, here's the name. You are matching one to the other. For example, I recognize right away that number 10 is that last thing that we just read about, an anemometer. So what I'm going to do is I am going to use my pen and match number 10 I know is the anemometer. So that is how you answer those questions. For these questions, you just write your answer on the line. Which instrument measures air temperature? 12, a barometer measures. 13, which instrument measures rain that has fallen over time? 14, what does a wind vane measure? 15, what does an anemometer measure? And 16 is a bonus question. A windsock indicates what? So you can find all those answers on this website. You can also use the snippets from the text yesterday to help you out. So that's the end of day number eight. Thank you so much for watching. I miss you and I hope to hear from you soon. Remember, if you need help on any of these things, please let me know or please let your teacher know. We really look forward to hearing from you guys and we love when you talk to us and when you reach out to us. Have a great day, guys, and I will see you soon.